Hey everybody, Brian Zane here with your Hell in a Cell review. An historic triple main event on Sunday night, including a super duper historic final match of the evening. But for now, let's get right into the pre-show. Cruiserweight goulash six-man tag team match in the pre-show. Just throw a bunch of guys in there and see what happens. It was Cedric Alexander, Sin Cara, and Lince Dorado taking on Tony Nese, Drew Gulak, and Arya Davari. To me, this felt like two different matches. Everything before Cedric Alexander got tagged in and everything after he got tagged in. To me, it felt like I was watching two separate matches because he put it into another gear when he got tagged in. Great stuff by Cedric. Great stuff by really pretty much everyone in the match except for Davari. Nothing against him, but he was the only one in the match that I didn't recall him doing anything of note. I mean, you know, Gulak got his holds in. Nice had his power moves. Uh, Dorado got a shooting star press in the first couple minutes of the match, which kind of killed the mystique of the shooting star press, in my opinion, because it was just this transitional sequence move that didn't mean anything ultimately. Uh, you know, so I think for the most part, everyone got their stuff in. It was a good, high impact match that the fans were into, and you know, it was a good pre-show match. The pre-show matches have got to be kind of fast paced. So the cruiserweights are the guys for the job. Of, uh, of course, Sinkara, Alexander, and Dorado win the match. The show officially opens with the first of three. Hell in a Cell matches, U.S. Championship match, Rusev fighting against Roman Reigns, the champion who was defending. I thought, that, you know, one thing was interesting in commentary, I think it was Corey Graves who said that Roman Reigns said earlier in the night that this match was going to look like a Game of Thrones style wedding. Hard to have that happen when no one's allowed to bleed. But be that as it may, I thought this was a very, you know, of the three Hell in a Cell matches, this is the one to me that felt the weakest, and that's kind of unfair for me to say that because I thought it was still a very strong match. You know, it's it was it was a tale of three different styles of matches in these Hell in the Cells, and this was the Haas match. You know, Roman Reigns, Rusev, both big, strong, physical dudes, and they just kind of hit each other with everything, including the kitchen sink. I thought Roman Reigns was taking just an unbelievable beating throughout the match, you know, which is very disproportionate to what Rusev got in the comeback, leading to Roman Reigns winning. And I'll get to that in a minute, but I thought, you know, it was just God, Rusev was just brutalizing him with a kendo stick, throwing him into the stairs in the corner of the stairs, exploding. That was a pretty cool spot. The accolade with the chain around the mouth. I thought, you know, it, a lot of big stuff happening to Roman Reigns. Now, granted, Rusev did take a lot of punishment, and there were a lot of Superman punches exchanged and stuff like that, and kicks and all that stuff. But I think, yeah, overall, I'd say that Reigns took the majority of the beating, uh, but still winning little, meh, you know, kind of a weird thing for me, but it was still a fun match to watch, a fun way to start the show. Bailey versus Dana Brooke, a match that nobody cared about, including myself, until Bailey hit her finisher on Dana Brooke and won the match. It's a pity that, you know, these two women, especially Bailey, have been kind of wasted on this feud. But again, this is kind of the weird spot that the women's division on Raw is in right now, where Nia Jax is doing her own thing. And I don't know if she's maybe on maybe on Raw tomorrow night. She's going to start something new. But right now, the women on Raw are kind of in this weird thing where they have to, you know, there's not too many options for any of the women involved. So this is what Bailey and Tanner landed on. And so hopefully after this, both women will move on. Ends on Cash taking on Gallows and Anderson in a match that I admit, uh, going into it, I didn't really care about for reasons I explained last week in Who Wore It Better. I feel that the segment, that, that singles match between Enzo and Anderson and the moments preceding it kind of just killed those two dead more than they've already been killed as far as Gallows and Anderson are concerned. And But I will say that this match exceeded my expectations. It was a basic match. You know, it wasn't pay-per-view worthy necessarily. It was just, you know, it was a good match, competent storytelling, Gallows and Anderson winning, which was good. They needed the win. Enzo and Cass aren't going to be hurt by the loss because they still have all this momentum with the fans. I will say the promo that started the match, the segment with Enzo and Cass cutting the promo on uh, Luke and Carl, to me was an incredible promo. It was one of my favorite promos uh, Enzo and Cass have done uh, in the last several months, in my opinion. But anyway, Anderson and Gallows winning with the magic killer and Enzo, a much needed, a desperately needed win for these two guys who, you know, they, they keep saying in the commentary, so it must be true. And just looking at it with your eyes, you see that these two have not been in a very good spot lately. So hopefully this win will be the beginning of something better for them down the line. Universal Championship inside Hell in the Cell. Kevin Owens defending against Seth Rollins. Uh, this match to me uh, was right up there with the Women's Championship match at the end for Match of the Night honors. Uh, for all intents and purposes, I thought it was a great match. These two had a really good just war in the cell. Uh, the one thing I would say was my, you know, it's kind of a nitpick, but at the same time, it's kind of important. There was just kind of a lack of selling at certain key points points in the match like there was the whole um, super kick enziguri clothesline sequence it was very strong style none of the guys were selling anything and then Owens with the clothesline of Rollins that kind of put me off and then especially the fact when uh, Owens got power bombed into two tables to the outside and I don't think he was down for more than 30 seconds before uh, Rollins 
picked him back up to put him in the ring. They really should have milked that for a lot longer than they did. But despite the two big points where there was not a whole lot of selling going on, I think everything else in the match to me just worked and clicked. Jericho running in, I expected something to happen, some kind of furthering of the storyline between Jericho and Owens where like Jericho accidentally almost costs Owens the match. That didn't really happen though, but it was definitely a two-on-one situation. Rollins, you know, looking like the big strong baby face, uh, fighting off, uh, you know, Owens and uh, Jericho in this case. Uh, again, power bombing Owens through two tables. That was a crazy spot, one of the biggest spots of the night. The match ends when Kevin Owens retains the championship by powerbombing Rollins through two chairs, and uh, that was the finish. Again, it was a brutal match. It was a lot of fun to watch. My one nitpick is that there's a couple points where I thought, man, I wish there was some better selling. Cruiserweight Championship matches. TJ Perkins defends against Brian Kendrick. I love that this whole storyline, they have just tap danced around the issue of why Kendrick got fired from his first run. They've done everything they can except say he loved weed. Nothing too outrageous or insane about this match. It was a very competent, uh, solid match for what it was. The finish was Kendrick going for the slice bread number two. He fakes a leg injury and suckers in TJ Perkins with a headbutt and makes him tap out with the captain's hook to become the new Cruiserweight Champion, which is great. It's a cherry on the top of Kendrick's redemption story that you saw at the beginning of the Cruiserweight Classic, so I love how they finally finished that. A couple of things about this match. One, I don't think they did enough to play into the whole thing where Kendrick wanted T.J. Perkins to lay down for him. Like, obviously, I don't think Perkins was going to do that, but I wanted to see more like internal conflict happening throughout the match on the part of T.J. Perkins. They played up a little bit in the pre-show. I didn't see enough of that kind of storyline play into it. And also one thing, I mean, the crowd just didn't really care about this match. Uh, and I think part of it has to do with the fact it just followed up a very exciting Hell in a Cell match, but also because it was just, it, you know, I think they really killed the Cruiserweight division. You know, it's really sad because my whole issue I've been saying for a while now with these guys is that they're giving no one any real storylines, not much any at all character development, except for Kendrick and Perkins, that they've been focusing on these two guys for so much. And even then, it's kind of a pedestrian amount of uh, energy and uh, investment in those where everyone else is just kind of let's throw these guys out there and yay cruiserweights because they, they they don't understand what makes wrestling so great it's not just the athletic stuff it's not just the kicks and the flips and the you gotta have story too you gotta have characters and even WCW could get that right. You had characters and you had stories with these cruiserweights. You know, with these guys, you don't have that. You just have ropes are purple now. These guys are strong hitters. Hooray! And, you know, and I've been saying that a lot. I've been harping on that a lot with the cruiserweights. But that's the problem. They've just killed the cruiserweights because they don't give fans a reason to care. Rich Swan can dance. That's about all I know about anyone who's not TJ Perkins and Brian Kendrick. Oh, yeah, and Cedric Alexander. He's great, too. So, but other than that, what do you have? Tag Team Championship match, The New Day defends against Cesaro and Sheamus, or as JoJo the Ring announcer said, it was for the Raw Tag Team Champions. I, you know, again, like the Anderson Gallows and Zone Cast match, my expectations for this match were not that high because we already just, we just saw the match in a non-title format the week before. So, in some ways, this match was very similar to that one, but at the same time, they added enough to it that got me interested in it, that made me, you know, invested in this match. Like, wow, it's actually, it's actually pretty fun. You see Sheamus kind of, you know, he, he almost cost them the match when he broke kicked Cesaro but you can see he's still putting in the effort to keep Cesaro in a position to win and to kick out and stuff. So yeah, I think there's a lot of good uh, playoff with those guys there. Once again, similar to the New Day's match against the Wyatt several months back, in my opinion, Xavier Woods was the MVP of the New Day. I think when he's given the chance to shine on a big stage like this, he just comes through in a big way. I just loved Xavier Woods' style. Uh, the finish was Cesaro had uh, Xavier Woods in the sharpshooter. Um, big E was trying to make the save, but uh, they, he and Sheamus got into a scuffle. Sheamus hitting Big E with the trombone. Co Kofi hitting Sheamus with Trouble in Paradise. The referee sees that part and DQs the New Day, allowing them to keep the Tag Team Championships, even though Cesaro and Sheamus uh, win the match. It was kind of a disappointing end of the match, but you didn't really want to see either team lose at this point. I mean, I think no matter, we know now that the New Day is going to break Demolition's record. It'd actually, be hilarious if Demolition came out on the day they tied the record and just beat him for it. That'd be hilarious if they just brought back Bill Eady and Perry Tarso, <laughs> these 50 something year old men in the face paint. That'd be hilarious. Uh, but, you know, they, so you can't have New Day losing because they're not going to lose the belts before they break the record. And you probably aren't going to have Sheamus and Cesaro. You know, you don't want them to lose necessarily because, you know, who knows? Maybe this will form into a more of an unlikely partnership and they do some more tag team stuff in the future. But if this dissolves right after this match, it's going to make Foley in kayfabe look like a big dum dum because he's the one who put these two together with the intent that these two could have magic and stuff. And we're starting to see that. I think maybe this is a slow burn. Maybe we're going to see great things out of this team soon enough. But right 
now it's like, you know, it just seems like, I hope they don't, they don't cancel the Cesaro Sheamus um, experiment too soon because that's going to make Foley look bad and it's going to make us feel like we've always had our time. The super duper main event, the final match, therefore it's the main event of this triple main event, women's championship, Hell in a Cell match, Sasha Banks defending against Charlotte. A few people I saw on the internet crop up and say, is this overkill? Because, you know, it's one thing to have the first women's pay-per-view main event. That's fine. But we're also getting the first women's Hell in a Cell match as well. You're getting two things in one. Isn't that a little overkill? Like, I get why people are saying that, but at the same time, this is the best chance they're going to have right now to have a women's pay-per-view main event because right now charlotte and sasha banks across both brands to me that is the storyline that's the only rivalry that would be befitting of a main event alexa bliss and becky lynch as of right now is good but we haven't even seen them wrestle one-on-one -on -one yet as far as i can recall and so we need to see that develop more in order for that to be something worthwhile but right now sasha and charlotte if for better or worse is the women's rivalry that could be befitting of a main event no one else right now uh, for at least six months i don't see could also live up to that that being said the entrances happen charlotte comes out on a throne and sasha banks comes out in a cadillac and speaking of recycling spots from two years ago they have sasha go through a table and the emts come out oh my god everyone's oh they're gonna throw the match out because she's hurt and everything and then you know she magically springs to life the second the referee is about to award the belt to charlotte and then they start fighting and everything i mean say what you will i think this match really lived up to the hype these two just beat the shit out of each other it was a very fun physical match to watch a lot of you know fun in a way it's like wow this match is, i think i think people are getting their money's worth but at the same time you're just watching just go, you groan and you gasp at, like these spots these women are doing you know charlotte's eating a chair and sasha's putting herself through the cell into the cell wall like the monkey flip she took where she landed really high on her back and the her neck was just sick to watch and it was it was a very brutal match you know i haven't seen brutality in a women's match like this in quite some time especially in wwe there were the eddie tribute spots the triple suplex and the frog splash for those kind of, eh, you know okay i'll let that slide the knees in the corner into the chair was pretty devastating uh sasha knocking charlotte into uh, off the top off the, off the corner onto the floor with the table the least satisfying table break of all time it was just like blah, blah. the match ends when sasha tries to give a running power bomb to charlotte but her back gives out charlotte just keeps tossing sasha into the table over and over again natural selection one two three charlotte wins the title for the third time and kills the crowd dead i think it was a little disappointing to have the hometown hero not come out victorious, but looking at taking a step back and just kind of looking at the whole thing, like, wow, it's still a very good story. The finish was a little meh, but I thought that just everything else in the match I, th I thought was great. Like I said, these women, this match lived up to the hype. You know, I thought it was just as brutal as Roman Reigns and Rusev. I thought it was just as brutal as, as Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins. I wasn't expecting to see a moonsault off the top of the cell. Um, you know, I was expecting some kind of, you know, cell play as far as climbing up the wall, which we saw at the very beginning uh, with, with the Sasha going to the table and everything. So I thought, yeah, I think it really checked all the boxes and I think it was a really fun match again. Didn't care for the fact that Charlotte won again, but uh, you know, I thought it was fine. I thought the, as an overall story, it was fine. It kind of cheapens the whole um, Sasha having the emotional victory for the title on Raw, both in the summer and a few weeks ago on Raw uh, when they were the main event a few weeks ago. So it kind of cheapens that, the fact that they went to the ball twice with that and then Charlotte wins the title the next pay-per-view. That happens twice now in this year. So I just hope that these two take a break from each other for a while because like I said, it's been a great rivalry. Every match they've had has been excellent to watch, but it's time to have something else happen. I was kind of, I was hoping Nia Jax would pull a cane and just rip the cell door open and interfere or something, declare herself as a number one contender, something, anything. I, I don't know what's going to happen on Monday, but I don't want to see these two fight again for a while. Not that I'm bored with them, well, I kind of am. I just think these two have done everything there is to do right now and they need to take a break from it. Overall, I'm gonna give Hell in a Cell 2016 a B grade. And I think that all three of the Cell matches were very good. I think, you know, even though I think Roman Reigns and Rusev was the weakest of the three in my opinion, part of that has to do with the fact it was the opener and part of that I just feel like it's a different style. It's the Haas versus Haas thing. It's gonna be a little slower than what you see with Rollins and Owens. It's gonna be slower than Sasha Banks and Charlotte. So to me, speed was an issue, but I think they they brought their own level of brutality that still made it entertaining. It's unfair for me to say that it was the worst of the three. It was just not the most entertaining of the three. So it's a very, very close race between, you know, the, the three of them, in my opinion. There were a couple of not so great points in the show. There was the Dana, Brooke, Bailey match that no one really cared about. The Enzo and Cass, Gallows and Anderson match. It was like, meh, you know, it was still a decent match, but to me, it, it was a storyline I didn't really care that much about. 
But the tag team championship match to me uh, was much better than I anticipated be, uh, to be. The Cruiserweight Championship match had a very very satisfying conclusion of Kendrick winning the championship. He's the man with the plan. And yeah, so overall I'm going to give Hell in a Cell a B grade. And with that, since No Mercy happened several weeks ago, time for another pay-per-view edition of Who Wore It Better. Comparing No Mercy and Hell in a Cell to me is a little tricky. Now, I watched No Mercy. I was there live in Sacramento, and I've said before that being at shows live can make shows more enjoyable to that viewer than someone with an outsider's perspective. Although, of course, that theory was completely destroyed after WrestleMania 32. But be that as it may, I thought No Mercy was okay, but looking back, there's only two matches that were made it worth watching. It was WWE title, it was Cena, Styles, and Ambrose, and it was Ziggler Miz. Those are the only two things. Everything else, to me, dragged the show down. Hell in a Cell it was not a perfect show, but the Cell matches I thought were all great. The Tag Team Championship match I thought was kind of a sleeper hit. Uh, so I think that alone, and then you add the Cruiserweight Championship match, which again, was a competent match. Anderson Gallows, Enzo, and Cass, that was a decent match. Uh, I thought, you know, overall, Hell in a Cell was a stronger pay-per-view. Hell in a Cell had the added attraction of three uh, gimmick matches, three Cell matches, so it inherently makes it more exciting to watch than No Mercy, which was a show which really had no gimmicks. So it's a little a bit of a disadvantage for No Mercy, but I stand by it. I think just if you look at them side to side, uh, Hell in a Cell was a stronger show overall than No Mercy. So I'm going to give Hell in a Cell a nod this month. So let me know what you thought about Hell in a Cell in the comment section below. What grade would you give Hell in a Cell? Let me know. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.